Hello, everybody. This is such a wonderful opportunity for me to interview a very special guest that comes from the other side of the ocean, and yet we're connected on Zoom, which is so fantastic. Please welcome author of the a Voyage with, uh, Without My Father, right? Is that, am I saying it right? A Voyage you are saying it perfectly. <laughs> with, with Dexter Moscow. Dexter, hello, hello, hello. And his son, Elliot, is joining us. So if you're going to listen to it on audio, you will be getting three voices here, so you will know. And if you're on live Facebook, welcome. This will also go on YouTube. So you'll have ample opportunity to listen and re-listen for this very special interview. So welcome, Dexter and Elliot. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you very much. In fact, Doris, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have a chat with you. <laughs> yes, and I found out about your book, of course, from Kate, from Kate Beck, who connected us, which I just love it. So tell us, before we go into the book, tell us about yourself a little bit. Well, as you say, I come from the other side of the pond, um, and thanks to COVID, was not allowed to see our family, Elliot, the grandkids, um, Maisie and Maddie, and of course, Erin, his wife, our daughter-in-law. And so we're just overjoyed to be here. Um, what I do at home is to help people present in this kind of environment. And the book that you very kindly invited me to talk about is something that is a passion of mine, helping people who have had grief. And in this pandemic age, a lot of people have been suffering. So that's me. Yeah, so tell us about your suffering and your grief as, as it matured into becoming this book. Thank you. Yes, it started actually when I was 10. I lost my dad when I was just 10 years old. He was only 45 at a time where statins and heart surgery had not even been found. And that had a tremendous impact on me, losing my dad at that age. But the true impact only came about much, much later in my life. I had a crisis of confidence and all of that when I was in my 40s, coincidentally when he died. Um, and so that prompted me to start to discover how I could heal myself of this terrible trauma that I experienced as a kid. And that's how A Voyage Without My Father evolved. Um, and as we've said, in this pandemic era, I was not allowed to see my dad because kids were not allowed to be in hospital. So I never got to say goodbye to him. A situation which so many people now have had the same experience. So I wanted to write something which would help them through that trauma wherever it would occur, because grief doesn't go away. We just kind of get to manage it. And so that's what I wanted to do with the book. Yeah, what a generous offering of service, really in the truest sense. You learn from your experience and you're there to help others. So if, if, if I were to ask you, for, I want it, I'm going to ask you, what do you think, you know, from the time that you were 10 to 40, how is it not bubbled up in, in different, or what are the ways that it bubbled up for you? I think the, the crisis point was when I found myself getting very angry at the boys and, and I, for no reason, I never hit, but I had the voice, um, which would strike terror into them. And I realized that this was not acceptable to, to shout and, and to be like I was. I realized something was wrong. So I went into psychotherapy for a year and a half. And I found <laughs> through these conversations that I was angry at my father for dying. But what do you do with that? You know, that you, you can't speak to him. Uh, but then I thought to myself, perhaps I can. And I found other therapies, other ways, positive intelligence being one of them in that in much later in life, where those conversations could take place. And so I created what I call the MIC, the meditation element, so that I could go to a deeper level, imagination, so that I could imagine that I was standing in front of him talking, and communication, which was the conversation. And I found that amazingly releasing that I was able to speak to him all the years after he had died I was still able to speak to him and tell him what I thought of him which was how dare you die and leave me as you had and so that started this conversation 
and then evolved into the book, helping others to have that conversation, even though or even when people had passed. So as a teenager, you were, you were very angry and, and explodes with emotion often. Mm. And, and felt very lonely, yeah, felt I, very isolated. That's what I wanted to ask you because I thought to myself, how, how were you with relationships with others? It's a very interesting question because um, I think that for many years, I didn't trust men. My relationship with men was very distant. How could I trust a man that when my own father had left me? Um, and I was very lucky throughout my life to have mentors, male mentors that I recognize that could help me to, to get through this, this trauma, to get through this negative feeling. And so um, I, I think that was the overall experience that I didn't trust men, but then these mentors came to me. I didn't seek them out, they found me, or perhaps a greater power did. Um, and that's what, that, that's what I think is my key message. When people come into your lives, and you recognize that they can add something to you. Don't turn your back. Don't be frightened of creating those relationships. Yeah, and it seems like that uh, the universe was even playing forward because you had two boys. So here it is that you are a, a role model to them. So not only you have role model for yourself, but then you're going to be role modeling to your children. And then you realize that that's not the image you want your kids to remember. Yeah. And, and isn't it isn't it interesting that um, often as the role model, hopefully that was a good one, the, the the master, the teacher becomes ultimately the pupil. And this was certainly involved in the writing of this book, because Elliot and his brother Alex were very, very effective in helping me to make the emotional aspect of the book come through. You know what? The, since you have quoted the Talmud in your book, I I. I will bench forward and I'll say one more quote, and it's Mikol Melamdai Eskalti Umitalmidai Yoter Mikulam. From all my teachers, I've gained much, but from my students, I've gained more. I've gained oh, the most. So, so, and your in this case, your children have been your students, right? From them. So, so since we have here a representative of your children, Elliot, welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Doris. I'm so pleased to be here to, to support Dad as he talks to you about the, uh, the book that took him, took him a long time and also took some really deep digging to be able to, to bring it to, to his audience. Yes, yes. So tell us about the impact of the book that it had on you and how was, maybe take it a step back, how was your upbringing, um, you know, until your dad turned 40, you were a young child, um, how was that effect and how did you see the change turned yeah I think I think it was always present you know maybe it was a little bit deeper until um that moment where you know dad maybe saw himself in his, his own father's shoes at that age um but I, you know I I consider myself to be very fortunate to have had a wonderful upbringing to very loving parents um, the, you know, their biggest challenge potentially for us was that as twins, how do they make sure that one doesn't feel like they're being treated, you know, less fairly than the other one or more fairly? And, you know, how do you, you know, manage the independence of two children who are the same? So, that, you know, there's a big challenge there. But what I, it, it, when I think back, um, there are those moments where you could see that there were two distinct sides. There was that, you know, my dad is incredibly affectionate man incredibly emotional man as well. So, you know, we got the, the benefit of all of that, but at the same time, there would be these moments where there would just be this show of anger, seemingly from nothing, you know, and yeah, fair enough, I, I work with parents myself and, you know, we can have a million things bubbling underneath that can be sort of taking us towards stress or uh, a trigger point. And it can be just something that a child says. So there was that as well, but there were just these moments where we were, it just felt like it came from nowhere. And we wondered, you know, what the matter was. And of course, as a child, you think to yourself, what did I do wrong? Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 it's really important to understand the balance. But yes, to answer your question, there were those seemingly just, you know, couldn't explain why it had happened. Yeah, yeah. So, so as a result of your book, uh, Dexter, 
what was some of the unexpected impact that your book had, not only on you and your family, but on the readers? Hmm. I, I think that the feedback I've got is that, um, that it, it echoes with a lot of the feelings. And, and one of the, the reasons, and, and it, it sounds sexist, but I think you would appreciate it. I wrote the book for men specifically because we don't talk about such things. And one of the lines in the book is showing weakness um, is, is not a weakness. Showing vulnerability is not a weakness, it's a strength. Uh, and so that was really one of the things that, I, 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 that came out of that. Um, often I've been asked, was it a cathartic moment writing this book? And I think in truth, it wasn't because I, I've done so much work on myself. What the catharsis came about, and, and this sounds perhaps very strange, was the, the most affecting part of the book was writing about a dog, a beloved dog that I unfortunately, and Elliot was there with me, um, that we had to put down because she had a cancer, a cancer of the stomach. And that wiped me out. Um, I literally had to go to bed for two days. Um, and it made me think, what is it that when we are strong, when we lose a relative or a, a dear friend, what makes us strong for, for that emotion not to overflow? But with a pet, it does. And I, I think that there was a release of emotion because there's no questioning. It's, it's a pure love from a pet. Um, and Elliot would know about this because we've got a little dog living with us here who's absolutely charming. Um, and I think that it added a dimension to the book that we can let everything go. We can be sad, we can cry, we can beat a pillow to get the emotion out, but the emotion must come out, otherwise that, that's damaging. So I think that was the cathartic moment, realizing that the love and the emotion that comes from losing a pet is something we should mirror when we lose a relative or a friend. Let the emotion out. Don't be strong for everybody around us. Yes, it, it absolutely resonates. And by the way, I do appreciate that a book was written to a, a, a sector of the population. And then other people can read it and enjoy it and benefit from it. I think there's power into it. I also know because I run positive intelligence groups and teams and so often men will share that they don't get this opportunity to delve deeper into feelings and to show emotions and to show vulnerability. So I think that is your book is absolutely an opportunity for those who want to pick it up and read that. It, they can only gain. They can only gain out of that. And at the same I, time, I I've hope seen, so. at the same time, I've seen my dog and how my husband is showing so much love and affection toward the dog that not, not necessarily is coming easy with other people. So I am completely relating to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So here's another I, question. I have another question you. if I may, yeah. Um, knowing that you're Jewish and can you share with us some of the impact that Judaism or the wisdom of Judaism that it had on you in writing this book? Because I know that you are quoting a, a sermon by, uh, by a rabbi about um, a verse from the Talmud, which triggered me as well as, you know, I don't know if you know, but I'm a Jewish educator, I've been for 30 years. And now that I'm a positive intelligence coach, I take some things from Judaism. So my question is that how did Judaism enrich your journey into writing this book and beyond? I, it's very important to me. Um, I, I'm not a particularly observant Jew. Um, I celebrate the high holy days. I celebrate the other ho holidays as well. And also, um, obviously, big losing a father, a mother and relatives. I, I observe yacht site and will go to shul to, to say the Kaddish for them. Um, so I, I think the essence of it is family. There, there's two elements of it. Family is embodied, the embodiment of Jewish life. Um, so that is very important to me and sharing that experience as well. I think the other element is um, that there is a direct conversation with, with God, with the Supreme Being, wh wh whoever we believe in. Um, 
And I, and I think that conversation is, is so important. It's mirrored in the conversation with my father. Um, and so the feeling that when we take these quiet moments and, and you certainly understand it and, and Elliot does, and I do in terms of positive intelligence, taking that moment to be quiet, to meditate if that's what, what it's necessary or visualize. And so I think that the element of that Jewish thought is that in those quiet moments, thoughts come to us, experiences coming to us, words or advice comes to us. And so I think those two elements, that family is important, but also listening to that still small voice, which may be inspirational from others, or it may be just that voice within us. And so that, that's what Judaism means to me, that a direction and the ability to talk directly to a supreme power. I, I just love that. And I think that small voice in us has appeared in Elijah's story, and it appears in our day to day life today in 2021 and will continue forever that that voice so since we're talking about positive intelligence and the intersection of positive intelligence and your book can you share with us what are a couple of the strategies that you implement in your book that could sh be in the same line and mindset as positive intelligence you talked about taking a moment to contemplate and to breathe. Share with us maybe a couple more tricks. Right, I, I think the, the two that I would certainly recommend that who, those who've never experienced positive intelligence is really the, the key element for me. Um, and that is to be able to see everything as a gift. Now, how could I say that losing my father was a gift? Um, it devastated me, it affected my life, it has affected my life. But I think that what it did, because my father was not there for me, it made me want to be there for my boys. And so my father was not there for my bar mitzvah, obviously. It was so important for me to be standing alongside my boys, reciting along with them their bar mitzvah portion. So that for me is the gift that I wanted to be the best father I could possibly be. The, the other element, um, and this is so important, is to see the essence of us, you know, the, the exercise of, of, our, of going to see a photograph of ourselves before we were 10. And of course, that was a key point for me because after 10, it was horrible. So being able to see the essence of myself through my eyes uh, of what, who I was at that age, being a child with all of the wonder that it, and the, the fun that could be gained. So for me, that was so key to positive intelligence, to go back and say who I was then, I am still now, and I can draw on that essence of fun, of cheekiness, uh, of, of just enjoying life. So that, that's the two really key elements for me, the seeing everything as a gift, the sage perspective, and also the childlike way that we can look at life. Beautifully put, beautifully put. Elliot, do you have anything else to add before I ask your dad, how can we find his book and how can we follow him? Yeah, for sure. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, for anybody who writes uh, their life story, it's a, a challenging journey. Um, and, you know, because they have to be fully vulnerable themselves to be able to dig deep into that. And I think that, you know, when we were, when dad was writing the initial drafts, um, some of the sort of depth of who he was was missing because it, you know, as I say, it's challenging to, to dig into that. And I think the one thing that positive intelligence and the other um, developmental elements that he's been doing for himself over the years is something that's really enabled him to do that. And, and a lot of that is in the book. And so it may not be communicated through the strategies or the process, but through the stories themselves. And I think that's really what uh, um, readers will gain from reading the book beyond the, the step by steps is just the, the insights they'll gain through his personal stories. I love that. I love that. And I definitely picked up the gift of time when Dexter, when you were talking about the gift of time, because time is, is um, measurable and limited. So the gift of time is something that we need to focus on in the every day, in the every minute. So thank you for bringing that into the book. Dexter, where can people find you and how can they connect with you further? 
Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity of saying this. First of all, you can get me on Amazon. Um, it's on an, there is an audible version, as you said. Um, it is in uh, paperback as well. So that, that's one of the ways that you can go. Just go on Amazon or audiobooks and audible. So, so that's where you can get it. Um, the, the thing I would say is obviously we've been talking about some very deep uh, emotional issues. The book has a lot of fun. Um, because it is episodic, it's a lot of stories. Um, I haven't called them chapters, I've called them scenes, because it's, it's very filmic in the way that it is created. Um, and so that, that's the way you can get the book. Um, please, if you want to make contact with me to share your feelings, share your concerns, or just share your lovely stories, then please contact me at Dexter at DexterMosco. .co.uk and I would love to start that conversation with you and again Doris thank you so much for allowing me to share my story with you. You are so very welcome it is absolutely my pleasure thank you Elliot for joining and um, I love the fact that you're right now in the northwest make the best of the year enjoyable and may you return safely back to London. Thank you very much indeed, and Happy New Year to everybody. Happy yeah. New Year, and I want to Happy finish holiday. with a quote that um, Rabbi Kushner wrote that uh, you quoted in your book, and it says, we can visit our past, but it's not a place to live in. And so with that, I wanted to all of us visit your past, but always come back to the present, and the sooner you come, the more benefit you get. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please rate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again, either on the podcast, YouTube, or Facebook Live. Bye, everybody. Bye.